Hi, this is Danielle Camboni and welcome back to StansberryInvestor.com. Thrilled to be kicking off our Outlook 2022. Those of you who have followed my career know that at the end of every year, I like to put together an Outlook uh, with some of your favorite guests and uh, incredible experts to get their thoughts on the upcoming year. We sit down with the editorial team and uh, discuss a theme. And for 2022, we have come up with the tipping point. Why the tipping point? Well, we are at a 40 year high for inflation. We have uh, the Federal Reserve, which will double the pace of the taper to 30 billion at its December meetings, which would approximately wind down the largest uh, asset purchase program in history uh, by March. And we have interest rates uh, hikes coming. So what does this all mean? Who wins, who loses? And most importantly, how do you come out on top, the investor? Well, to start off our series, I thought, who could we bring on? And uh, I couldn't wait to have Jim Rickards here with us today. He is the best-selling author and the editor of the newsletter, Strategic Intelligence. He's a great friend of our show and one of the brightest minds out there. Uh, Jim, welcome back as always. Thank you, Danielle. Great to be with you and, uh, and Merry Christmas and Happy New Year to all of our viewers. And Merry Christmas to you as well, Jim. Uh, let's start with uh, the elephant in the room here, the story that doesn't go away. It's inflation. Now, when we spoke back in April, uh, you weren't so concerned uh, by looking at the numbers at the time, but you did say inflation was coming. Uh, where are we at today? How massive of a problem is it? Sure. Um, we're, we're six months down the road. Uh, it, here's the thing, uh, Danielle. Inflation is a is potentially a huge problem and a huge threat, but in my view, it's not coming. It's it's just about over, um, in the sense that we've seen um, peak inflation uh, as of now, and it'll it'll start to go down a lot a lot faster than people expect. You know, going back to April, in April, May, and June, I'll, I'll say even into July, um, I actually expected the inflation as did a lot of analysts, and there was a reason for that, which has to do with what are called base effects. So you have not to get too technical, but you have to know how the government calculates inflation that we all read about in the headlines. Uh, and they take it monthly, but they do it year over year. So April 2021 was compared to April 2020, you know, May 2021 was compared to May 2020 and so forth. And that's just how they do it. Then they take the monthly year over year increase, they annualize it, there's a little math, but basically times 12, a little more to it than that, but that's basically it. And then that's the headline number you hear, you know, up 6% or up 7%, et cetera. Well, if you, if you look at April, May, June, July, 2021, year over year, what was going on in April, May, June, July of 2020? That was the worst depression, worst collapse of the U.S. economy since 1946. So yeah, not only you know, go back to 2020, prices are actually going down. So when you got to 2021, you would expect them to go out. That would be perfectly normal in a year over year comparison. There's some of the better analysts actually. So let's use 2019 as a base year because it was unaffected by COVID, but, but be that as it may. So you expect it. So the question was, was it transitory in Jay Powell's famous phrase, famous word, uh, or would it um, peter out? Well, you wouldn't find out until the, the really the, the fourth quarter of 2021, because if you, uh, and third quarter and fourth quarter, because if you go back to 2020, um, uh, the economy was booming in the third quarter. That was, just as the second quarter was the greatest collapse, one of the greatest collapse, uh, third quarter was one of the greatest uh, increases. So that would tend to erase the base effects, and you'd be looking at something closer to you know, real inflation or something that might be persistent. Um, and uh, uh, so, so there I would say when we got to September, October, November, uh, even now we have some December data, that inflation has persisted. So it did last longer than I thought, uh, but I, I'm sticking with the view that it's going to go away pretty quickly and we've seen the peak. You know, in last summer, I was a little uncomfortable because the Fed was saying transitory and I was saying transitory. And, but one of my uh, thesis, the way I do a lot of analysis is that the Fed is always wrong. So I was very uncomfortable being on the same side as the Fed. It's like, oh, maybe I'm missing something if they agree with me. But uh, but they've, Jay Powell has thrown in the towel um, and uh, they've flipped. So now they say it's not transitory, it's here to stay. So I feel much better saying it's transitory because now I'm on the opposite side of the debate with the Fed. Uh, although I will say what Powell did was highly political. He got renominated by President Biden. Okay, that means you have hearings. That means you're in front of the Senate uh, and you're gonna get grilled on inflation. So he had to get on the right side of the trade, so to speak, 
in order to mitigate some of the damage that I think it's one thing to say you're ahead of the curve. It's behind the curve, rather. It's another thing to say you're still behind the curve, but um, he's doing the best he can. They said they're going to accelerate the taper. Yes, that implies that they're going to accelerate the liftoff, meaning the first interest rate hike sometime in late 2022. The market, um, at least the futures market, Fed fund futures market seems to agree. So he's sort of positioned himself for the political grilling, but I don't think he's analytically right. I think we're, we're now, it did last a little longer than I, little longer than I expected, mostly because of gasoline and, and autos, but you know, they're real things, you gotta buy them. Uh, but now I expect the inflation to come down very quickly. Okay, well, this will bring a lot of Christmas cheer to the folks up there, Jim, because I get you know emails every day from people, Americans, Canadians, they're just drowning um, in, you know, in the prices, they're struggling. Um, so the worst is behind us, Yes. Um, and, uh, and, and hey, I, I, I use gasoline in my car. So uh, I, I go to the pump. It used to be $50 to fill up the car. Now it's $70. So I get it. I'm, you know, I'm not uh, immune to any of this. And I understand what's going on. And it is hard on people. So I completely, uh, completely understand that. But there are um, recursive functions or, you know, what people call feedback loops where, you know, our, your series is called the tipping points. So we're into physics. So uh, let's, uh, uh, recursive functions when we have an equation and the output becomes the input of the next iter iteration and you run the equation again and graph it and see where it goes and it can go crazy places so rising prices here's what you have to ask yourself why are they going up okay and is it sustainable is this something that's going to continue it has nothing to do with money supply you know your typical austrian economist monetarist who said well the fed printed all this money and that's what's causing inflation it's not true um the fed has printed the money that part's true you can just you know that's public data they print it five or six trillion dollars of base money but they they print it by buying bonds from the banks that you know they pay for bonds with money that comes out of thin air they get the bonds put them on the balance sheet and the banks get the money what have the banks done with the money they gave it back to the fed in terms of excess reserves. So you're inflating, but you're, you're increasing both sides of the balance sheet. You're increasing the assets and you're also increasing the excess reserves, but the money didn't go anywhere. That money did not get out into the real economy. For that, you have to look at M2, you have to, or M1, you have to look at what the banks are doing. Are they making loans? Are people borrowing money? Are the bank balance sheets blowing up? And the answer is no, they're just buying government bonds. Um, and so, uh, you know, they can make money doing that if, as long as the Fed holds down the, um, uh, the Fed funds rate or, or, or by extension, the repo rate. So, so the money's not going anywhere. That's not what's causing the inflation that we see. Uh, it is caused by really, really bad energy policies by the Biden administration. You, know, you shut down fracking, you shut down or you handicap fracking, you shut down new leases for oil and natural gas exploration on federal lands. Um, you uh, close the Keystone XL pipeline. Um, you do everything possible to raise the price of gasoline because they want to promote the Green New Deal, wind and solar, right. which is uh, ridiculous. So it's not surprising we have higher energy prices and, and Putin's not dumb. He sees what's going on in the US. He goes, hey, you're shutting down energy production. Well, I'm going to shut it down a little bit too, just to raise the price because I'm making more money. So, so that explains that. That's not a monetary phenomenon. That's not because the Fed's printing money, which they are. It's because Biden has completely messed up the, uh, the energy supply chain. Okay, so bad policy, not uh, increase in money supply. Correct. Of inflation. Uh, but on the, on the energy side, automobiles are also a big part of it, used cars in particular. The reason used car prices are going up is because you can't get a new car. Why can't you get a new car? Well, the answer is your, your car is really a computer on four wheels. Um, they're full of semiconductors, all these monitoring and braking systems and uh, you know, engine diagnostics, and uh, some of them are self-driving, you know, uh, navigation systems. They all need semiconductors everywhere. And there was a semiconductor supply chain breakdown. And if you can't get the semiconductors, you can't make the cars. There wasn't a shortage of steel or rubber for tires or glass or leather upholstery. It was a shortage of semiconductors. Mm -hmm. So that shut down new car production. So people say, well, I'll go buy a used car. Well, guess what? The price of used cars went up. So used cars and gasoline and fuel are components of the inflation indices. They're real. You got you to pay them. Um, and that is why inflation is going up. But it's not a monetary phenomenon. It has nothing to do with the Fed. Um, actually, nothing to do with federal deficits. The, the, these things are problems, by the way. I'm not saying but money. If, if, is not. If it is tied to policy, Jim, right? If it is tied to policy, um, are you hopeful that the, the, the policies will be reined in, that they'll, they'll get a better grip on them to fix the inflation situation? 
Yeah, I'm, I'm not hopeful that the Biden administration will get anything right, but some of these things are, are one-time things. In other words, yeah, okay, you cut energy output, Putin raised prices, uh, Saudi Arabia raised prices, right. or gas prices. What do you have to ask yourself? Is that going to keep going? Okay, it, it has happened. I mean, you know, I say you're entitled to your own views. You're not entitled to your own data. Uh, and the data says that the things you're describing have happened. But as an analyst, you have to say, will they continue? And this is where the, the feedback loop comes in. Well, if I spend $70 filling up my car instead of $50, that's $20 less that I have to spend on anything else, you know, going out to dinner, buying some new clothes, uh, shopping, whatever it is. And so the history of higher energy prices is that it throws the economy into a recession. And for that, just look no further than the period from uh, 1973 to 1982. It's a, a nine year period. We had we had quadrupling energy prices. Energy prices went to the moon, um, but we had three recessions, two of which, 1974 and 1982, were at the time the worst recessions since the Great Depression. Now, we've managed to break those records in 2008 and 2020, but uh, at the time, they were, they were very bad recessions. So higher energy prices can be sustained to a point, at which point they become such a burden that you get layoffs, uh, reduce consumption, um, you know, reduce savings, et cetera, and the economy tips into a recession. So I'm not, I'm not forecasting recession, but forecasting slowing growth and slowing increases in energy prices. Uh, yeah, that's, that's definitely the forecast because it's, it's, it's kind of running out of steam to sustain itself because it has adverse effects. Now, if you look at the yield curves though, uh, it would suggest that there is a policy mistake um, and going back to the word transitory, which, you know, is coming back to haunt Powell, um, you know, some experts like Mohammed el Arayan have said that is the worst mistake the Fed has made in history, saying that rates were transitory. Um, so the question is, are they going to be forced to play catch up here and, you know, taper faster than they expected? And what will that do to markets? Well, they are going to play catch up with something that's not happening. Uh, in other words, the mistake the Fed is making is not the one El Arian points to. Yeah, El Arian is like a really smart guy. I read his stuff, but he's one of these global elites and they're always in an echo chamber. They're always, you know, um, kind of repeating what each other is saying. So yeah, now it's popular. Now that once Jay Powell said it's not transitory, it's popular to say, see, we told you it's not transitory. You, you know, you you were too slow. The Fed is kind of irrelevant. The Fed actually doesn't matter. Um, the real economy matters. A lot of other things um, matter. But no, as far as L.A. Aaron is concerned, I was saying, you know, the worst mistakes the Fed ever made were causing the Great Depression uh, and uh, causing the mortgage bubble, which led to the 2008 global financial crisis. Those are world-class mistakes. They kept rates too low for too long between 2002 and 2006, blew up the mortgage bubble and almost destroyed the world. That's a little bigger mistake than what they just did. Here's the mistake the Fed is going to make. Right. The Fed is going to tighten into weakness. They've, they've already said they're going to accelerate the taper. They announced a taper that would last from, uh, well, started November um, uh, 2021, and it was supposed to be over by June 2022. Now, it looks like they're going to have it done by March. That means they're going to taper faster. That implies that the first rate hike, the so-called liftoff, will happen sooner. So you might even get the market saying three rate hikes in 2022. We'll see what happens, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't rule that out. Every, everything I just described is a mistake because they are tightening into weakness. And by the way, Danielle, this is important. We've seen this movie before. The Fed in 2013, the Fed announced a taper. They finished the taper by 2014. They did the liftoff in 2000, December 2015, took them almost a year to raise rates, but they did it. Uh, then they continued to raise rates in 2016, 17, 18. What happened uh, in October, beginning of October 2018? From October 1st to December 24th, 2018, the stock market crashed 20%. Now, as the Fed was moving towards to go, hey, we want to normalize rates, we want to normalize the balance sheet, we want to get get the balance sheet down, get rates up, kind of get back to normal, but they couldn't do it. They destroyed the stock market 20%. And that wasn't, that wasn't COVID. That wasn't, you know, what happened in 2020. They did that in, in the last quarter, fourth quarter of 2018. So now we're, we're watching the same thing again, you know, bring down the balance sheet, finish the taper, raise rates, and they're going to trash the stock market again. Right. But, and we'll, 
will it throw a wrench in things for them with the new variant now, with the situation in China? Will that perhaps change the narrative for the Fed? Will they have to pivot again? Uh, it will, but they'll be the last to know. I mean, the Fed, the Fed's kind of in a bubble. Uh, yeah, you're, here's the thing with Omicron. Uh, it uh, again, it's early days. I don't want to overstate the evidence, but the, the best evidence so far, a lot of it coming out from South Africa, is that it's highly contagious and very mild. So does it spread around faster? Yes, more people get it, but it, you don't get particularly ill. And, and the lethality, the fatality rate is extremely low. So that's the good news. So more people are going to get Omicron, but far fewer people are going to get severely ill or die, which means we can kind of live with it. it it's a, but having said that, there are certain politicians, let's start with the governor of New York, the governor of California and Chairman uh, Xi Jinping in China, uh, our, and Australia, forget, I have a lot of friends in Australia, boy, are they suffering. That place has turned completely fascist. But uh, in China, which is communist, um, they're pursuing a zero COVID policy. You might as well pursue a zero cold policy. We're saying, we're going to run our country so nobody gets a cold. Well, that's that's well, that's what they're doing. That, that's what, I mean, COVID has kind of become, I'm not saying it's not severe. I mean, a lot of people died, I get it. Right. But it's kind of like a cold at this point. It's just spreading around. You're not going to be able to get rid of it. You have to learn to live with it with, with treatments and, and so forth. The vaccines don't work, by the way. The, the vaccines do reduce symptoms and they do reduce fatalities. And those are good things. And if you want to get vaccinated, you know, go for it. But they do not stop you from getting infected. And they do not stop the spread. They were kind of sold as that. That's not what they do. It's not really a vaccine. It's a treatment, uh, if you will. Uh, and, and again, it reduces symptoms. And that's, that's a big deal. But um, the, the, actually, the first data on Omicron from uh, the, were the, the first wave of states, there were 12 states. Now, I think it's in probably 40 states uh, or more. But in the first 12 states, there were about 30 or so cases. And, the, and they, they had data on who was vaccinated, not vaccinated, or they just didn't know or had no one asked. Um, and the number one source of infection were the vaccinated. Uh, and then the unvaccinated, then the I don't know category. So I'm not, I'm not blaming people who get vaccinated. That's up to them. But it doesn't stop you from getting it. But, but, but what's going on in China? So they had an outbreak near the, the largest, sorry, the fourth largest container port in the world in southern China. The, the, the same province, adjacent city, had an outbreak. They shut it down. They shut it down. They put 50,000 people in quarantine. That's going to spread to that port. What happens when you shut down the fourth largest container port in the world, which is what this is? Uh, well, you know, there goes uh, Chinese ma manufacturing. There go Chinese exports. Going to make the supply chain worse. Uh, you know, which is already a, a, a problem. So, uh, and again, Australia, I don't know what to say. They, they've lost their minds. So um, uh, these are drags on growth. Uh, everyone's like, oh, you cut down the supply chain. Doesn't that mean higher prices? In a limited sense, yes. But what it really means is, is layoffs. Uh, you know, if, if, if you can't run a warehouse, if, the, if you don't need people at the supermarket because the shelves aren't full, uh, et cetera, it, it actually makes things worse. Jim, let's bring it home now, like we always do. All Roads Lead to Gold. Uh, you were the author of the book, Gold. Uh, in the past, when we spoke about inflation, we said, look, when inflation does start to soar, we're going to see gold prices really take off. If we were at peak inflation, where was the gold price, Jim? Well, uh, inflation it does drive gold prices higher. That's, that's very clear. But it's not the only thing that drives gold prices. The, real, the best way to understand gold is think of it as a form of money, which I do. So everyone in foreign exchange trading looks at the euro, US dollar cross rate. Well, you should, because that's the largest, most liquid um, exchange pair traded in the world. You know, are talking trillions of dollars a day. Uh, and when people look at dollar indices, you know, DXY and, and a couple others, Fed index, so like, the dollar is really strong. Well, it is. Um, but you can look at the, at the dollar price of gold you know, measured by weight and think of it as a cross exchange rate between gold, one form of money, and the dollar, another form of money. So if you want a higher dollar price for gold, which gold investors do, and that's, uh, then the dollar has to get weaker. So, uh, but right now we're in a little king dollar episode. I mean, the dollar is right. crushing, crushing the euro, right. crushing the pound. So gold, gold is not crashing. It's not going down a lot, but it's in a really tight range. Um, but for gold to go up a lot higher, you're either going to need inflation, which I don't expect, or you're going to need a, a much weaker dollar. Um, that that will come, but not yet. So uh, so I would expect gold to kind of. 
go sideways for a while. It will break out. It will break out to the upside, but not right away because um, because the dollar is still king. Well, what, when you say will come, but not yet, what will be the event that will trigger that? Well, well, as U.S. growth weakens, somebody at the Treasury, not Janet Yellen, because she doesn't understand any of this. I mean, she's a labor economist and stat, statistical geek. She doesn't understand international economics. You'd have to go to like Leo Brandert or someone for that. But at some point, they're going to cheapen the dollar. Not yet, but they're going to say, oh, wait a second. Now, the U.S. can't be can't shoulder the entire burden of the world. We need a weaker dollar to promote our exports, promote export related jobs, compete with Airbus, et cetera. And when they do that, uh, then the price of gold will take off because it's, it's just an, it's just a cross rate. It's just an inverse relationship. Jim, uh, let's let's wrap with this then. Um, what Jim Rickards is investing in. Um, have you changed anything to your portfolio as we're about to start it, the new year here, given all the events that are unfolding? Yeah, not much. I mean, I I I, I counsel diversification, and everyone's like, "Well, of course, that's obvious. You want diversification." But the problem is, people don't know what diversification is. Like, yeah, I run into people. They own. They say, "Well, I own, I'm diversified. I own 50 stocks in 10 different sectors. You know, semiconductors, consumer non-durables, whatever." And I'm like, "No, you're not diversified. You may have 50 stocks, but you have one asset class, which is stocks." And they're not highly correlated when you don't care. And they're extremely correlated when you do. They all go down together. They go up together as they have, but uh, they can go down together too. So real diversification, have some stocks if you want, sure. Uh, I recommend a big slug of cash because it gives you, it reduces volatility and gives you optionality. Right. Um, uh, uh, 10% gold. Uh, one of my best investments actually lately is, is, a, is a gold mine that's doing extremely well. Um, and uh um, you know, natural resources, um, I think energy stocks will do fine. Uh, real estate is doing extremely well. Uh, so, so to me, diversification is, you know, some stocks, real estate, cash, gold, energy, and, you know, private equity hedge funds, if you can find them. Is your gold company a junior, a mid-tier, or a senior? Yeah, I can't. I, it, it's private, so it's not, it's not publicly traded, and uh, I can't. Uh, I have um, to try well, you, you're, you're allowed to ask, but uh, um, uh, but having said that, I visited the mine. It's uh, it's great. It's just it's fun to be a thousand feet underground and see see how it actually goes down in North America. North America, I'll say that much. Um, the point about cash. I just want to hone in on that a second. That's interesting because you echo a similar sentiment to Rick Rule. Uh, because I've had other guests on who, who have said I've completely, you know, if I was 25% cash, I've now changed that into cryptos. They want to be right. out of cash, out of the banking system. There's been a lot of talk on the banks are going to fail. Why be in that system? Get out of the system. What's your thoughts on that? Yeah, two things. Number one, cash. Uh, let's look at the, the benefits of cash. Everyone knows the, arg the arguments against it. it has very low yield, which is true. Uh, I could be in stocks or something and you know, making a lot more money. Um but that's the price you pay. It's like insurance premium for a lot of optionality. When I say optionality, um, if things start to crash, if things start to turn out unexpectedly, if certain uh, parts of the portfolio underperform, the person with cash can go shopping. You know, if stocks crash, you know, 20%, you can go out. And, and by the way, just to be clear, Danielle, you have to be nimble. I know the reason for being in cash is so you can be nimble. I'm not saying be in cash forever. I'm saying be in cash for now, so, you know, maybe 30% so that you can be the one who goes shopping when things fall apart. So cash is more nimble for you than perhaps converting that percentage into Bitcoin. Uh, I don't own any Bitcoin. I don't recommend it. I, uh, I'm not, I'm not some anti Bitcoin, uh, uh, you know, crusader, whatever. Um, I always say, if you want to buy Bitcoin, knock yourself out. And you, you know, I participated as yes. behind the scenes a little bit in the great debate between Frank Jostra and, uh, and, and Michael yeah. Saylor. Um, and uh, I was on Frank's side, but uh, no, I, uh, I, I watch it. Um, I, uh, I'm actually doing some writing about it lately. I, and by the way, I'm not new to the party. I, I did gold Bitcoin debates, you know, 10 years ago or, or longer. Um, and I'm not a technophobe. I'm, I'm actually involved with cutting edge artificial intelligence, working with a supercomputer down in Florida. So, um, so I get it, but uh, I, you know, I just paraphrase Gertrude Stein. There's no there there. I mean, the, what's interesting about the Bitcoin ecosphere or whatever, however you want to describe it, the Bitcoin bubble 
you know, Wall Street have brought all their analytical tools to the party. You know, you got, you know, candlesticks and Bollinger Bands and a 50 day moving average and trend analysis and uh, comparisons and uh, volatility and every tool, every analytical statistical tool you can think of has been applied to Bitcoin. But when you get to the center, the core of the Apple, there's nothing there. Um, so it goes up, whatever it is. Um, at least like Tesla, for example, maybe you like Tesla, maybe you don't, but they make real cars there. You can drive one. Um, and the same thing, and um, it's not an tangible, intangible thing. There are plenty of intangible assets that have a lot of meaning. Euro dollar futures that, that have uh, a, a lot of predictive analytic power. If you, if you understand, you know, kind of going out the curve, et cetera. So it's not like, it's not an intangible thing. It's not a digital thing. Um, it's, the thing thing, you know, so you, you can't, what is it? You can't do anything with it. You can, you can trade it back and forth. You can watch it go up or down. You can analyze it to death, but uh, at the end of the day, it's not good for anything. Jim, uh, as always, this was just, you know, a fascinating, insightful conversation. I'd like to leave you the last word uh, to the folks at home as any holiday message you'd like uh, to share with them. Um, as you know, they're thinking about their money, thinking about how to position themselves, and of course, thinking about their family, their health, more important than money. Um, final thoughts? Yeah, I've, I've followed the COVID situation closely. As you know, my last book was, uh, it was called The New Great Depression, but it was only three chapters on economics. The other three chapters were on the pandemic, um, you know, historically, medically, and, and I had a whole chapter on the mental health aspects of this, which I think is very underreported and misunderstood. I would encourage people, uh, you know, get out and socialize and, and just start to enjoy life. Uh, you know, COVID's out there, but uh, but there are a lot of other dangers, including mental health dangers, uh, addiction, suicide coming from this. We need to get that behind us and kind of get back to normal. Jim, um, on behalf of everyone here, I just want to thank you so much for your thoughts. Thank you uh, for coming on to kick off our Outlook series. Uh, you are a gift. I am thankful for you and your thoughts, uh, which are always next level. Uh, Merry Christmas to you and your beautiful family. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you all for watching. We're just we're just getting started here with the great Jim Rickards. Uh, we'll have many other guests joining us on our Outlook 2022, the tipping point. So be sure to stay tuned to stansberryinvestor.com. In the meantime, don't forget to sign up for premier access to content at daniellacombone.com. That's it for me. Thanks for watching.